Hi, my name is Rachel, and today we're doing another Authors Behaving Badly. Today's author is TJ Klune. Specifically, we're going to talk about TJ Klune and his book, House in the Cerulean Sea, which, listen to me, I get it. I loved the book when I read it too. A lot of us did, but when a community speaks about their own experiences being appropriated, we need to listen. I've compiled what happened, and I will relay that for you today. Please behave yourselves in the comments. TJ Klune, uh, according to Macmillan's author bio for him. TJ Klune is the New York Times and US Today, USA Today best-selling Lambda Literary Award winner, author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, Under the Whispering Door, In the Lives of Puppets, and the Green Creek series for the adults, The Extraordinary series for teens, and more. Being queer himself, Klune believes it's important now more than ever to have accurate, positive queer representation in stories. So we can agree, TJ and I, that representation, accurate representation, positive representation matters. Good. Okay. The House in the Cerulean Sea became a huge deal in book internet circles. Everybody was reading it and most people were loving it, including me. This is about a guy named Blindness Baker. The synopsis reads, he lives a quiet, solitary life. At 40, he lives in a tiny house with a devious cat and his old records. As a caseworker at the department in charge of mag magical use, youth, he spends his days overseeing the well-being of children in government-sanctioned orphanage orphanages. When Linus is unexpectedly summoned by extremely upper management, he's given a course. God! He's given given a curious and highly classified assignment, travel to Marcius Island Orphanage where six dangerous children reside, a gnome, a sprite, a wyvern, an unidentifiable green blob, a were Pomeranian, and the Antichrist. Linus must set aside his fears and determine whether or not they're likely to bring about the end of days, but the children aren't the only secret the island keeps. Their caretaker is the charming and enigmatic Arthur Parnassus, who will do anything to keep his ward safe. As Arthur and Linus grow closer, long-held secrets are exposed and Linus must make a choice, destroy a home, or watch the world burn because of the Antichrist part of it, by the way. Everyone was obsessed with this adorable, kind of cozy little queer story about a found family until we found out the inspiration behind the story and what the implications of that were, like what the parallels were between who TJ Klune had created and real world people. In an interview on March 16th of 2020, he says, The House in the Cerulean Sea is a bit of a quirky fantasy. It deals with some very real topical specific issues. It actually started from a Wikipedia article article because I have a tendency to get lost in Wikipedia for a long time and that's a problem. But I will be in one article and I'll click on another one, then another one, and then another until I'm completely off what I was trying to look up to begin with. But I came across something known as the 60s scoop, which was in Canada during the 50s and 60s where indigenous children were taken from their homes and put in government sanctioned orphanages for lack of a better word. And the idea stuck with me. It was something that I could not shake. And this was, this was at the end of 2017-ish. I had just finished writing my YA debut, The Extraordinaries, and I was looking into wanting to continue along in that vein with something a little bit different. And so when I stumbled upon this article about children being taken because they were different or they didn't adhere to what standards people thought should be at the time, it was something I couldn't get out of my head. But I didn't want to co-opt, you know, a history that wasn't mine. I'm a cis white dude, so I don't can't ever really go through something like what those children had to go through. So I sat down and was like, I'm just going to write this as a fantasy. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a second. When you are directly inspired by something and then you decide to put it in a fantasy, that does not mean that it's not you still appropriating. <laughs> you taking a real world event and then putting it directly into a fantasy does not divorce it from its origins. I'm going to write about an almost Orwellian society where the government sees everything and watches everything you do and follow a man who is stuck in a rut. He's a cog in a bureaucratic machine named Linus. I wanted to follow him. He's not necessarily prejudiced at the beginning, but he believes everything everybody has ever told him. His supervisors, the management superiors, everybody's told them that things have to be a certain way. So he's gone that certain way. And when I finished the book in spring of 2018, it was a couple of months later that all the news came out of everything that goes on at the United States southern border with children being taken away from their parents and put into government sanctioned camps. And I was like, this is a little too close to home. I don't know how I feel about this. So I wasn't sure what to do with it, if I thought I should change it or if I should leave it as it is because it's topical now more than ever and it's prescient and it sucks that it has to be that way. But I think that this story will bring the idea that we have to speak up. We have to speak for those that can't speak for themselves and that's the kind of theme that the whole book is is to raise your voice for those who don't have one. Now that by itself I have a problem with because those people do have voices. They can speak for themselves. You should amplify them instead of speaking for and over them. March 17th in another interview he's talking about create the the idea for the story. It create it remained fuzzy until I stumbled across the 60 scoop something I'd never heard of before something I'd never been taught in school. I'm American by the way. In Canada beginning in the 1950s and continuing through the 1980s indigenous children were taking 
taken from their homes and families and placed into government sanctioned facilities such as residential schools. The goal was for primarily white middle class families across Canada, the US, and even Europe to adopt these children. It's estimated that over 20,000 indigenous children were taken and it wasn't until 2017 that the families of those affected reached a financial settlement with the Canadian government totaling over $800 million. I researched more and discovered more instances the world over in my own country and abroad of the same thing happening. Families being separated because they were different, because of the color of their skin, because of their faith, because those in power were scared of them. Nope, incorrect. He, that, that's really the, the crux of the issue here is that he frames it as that, as it was, they were just scared and that's not true. And that's really where he went wrong was not only did he choose to write about something that was not his to write about, but he misunderstood it and then jumped from there. And now the whole thing's fucked up because he didn't understand the crux of the issue in the first place. And I will go into that more in a minute. I wrote the house in the Cerulean Sea in the spring of 2018. Months later in the summer, news exploded from our southern border about families searching for a better life being separated and put into government sanctioned facilities. History, as it does with terrifying consistency, was repeating itself once again. Let me be upfront about something. I'm a white dude. There really, there really isn't much I should be preaching about. I'm queer and a loud one at that. But the marginalization I face because of this isn't to be compared to others facing bigotry. It's not a contest. It sucks across the board. But I'm a mid-30s cis man in America. I'm privileged in ways others are not. I know this. So when I wrote Cerulean, I knew I had to do so carefully to make sure that I decided on on that what I decided on to be the central theme of the story wouldn't be lost. The central theme? Kindness. Here he has fucked up again. Look, I get how that sounds. I'm sure the more than a few of you are ro rolled your eyes, reading this, rolled your eyes at the wor word. It's trite, isn't it? Sure it is, but stick with me for a moment. I'm gonna stick with you, but you already lost me. As I write this, it's 2020 and we're so divided. Red flag, big red flag. I don't know how we'll recover from it. Those in power fling insults as easily as they breathe. People take to the streets in masks and hoods, spreading their hate as if it were gospel. We're all so angry almost every second of the day and we have a right to be. We should be angry. The world is on fire. The news grows more dire with each new breaking broadcast. People are hurt or worse, killed because of who they love, who they believe, what they believe, and the color of their skin. We've lost our way and I worry that this has become our new normal. I can only do what I think I do best right. And so I began writing The House in the Cerulean Sea, imagining a world not so different from our own, where people who are different than the majority are controlled by those in power. The smallest of us, the children, are taken from their homes and placed in euphemistically named orphanages overseen by caseworkers in Dicomy. It's the department of, for the children. Lying is sent on a top secret assignment to investigate a special orphanage, one hidden away, housing what the world considers to be the most dangerous of children. What he finds there changes him. How exactly you'll have to read for yourself. But I never strayed away from kindness as a theme. It was and still is important to me. To offer a hand in compassion rather than a fist raised in anger seems like it should be common sense, but many appear to have forgotten that. We all, like Linus discovers, need to use our voices for those who can't speak for themselves. Again, I take issue with that. Those who should be allowed to be small in this great wide world, but sometimes we also need to shut up and listen to those small voices because if we don't we run the risk of drowning them out. Buddy, you did! <laughs> You did that! We are better than what we currently seem to be. I know we are, and I don't believe it's too late for us to course correct. It's going to take time and a hell of a lot of work, but we're capable of it. The House in the Cerulean Sea is my great wish into the universe, a fable about the goodness in us all, if only we can believe it. Hope is a weapon, kindness our battle cry. As long as we stand together, I know we'll shape this place we call home into something we can all be proud of. Okay, let me give you a lot of background information. The 60 Scoop was coined by a man named Patrick Johnston, author of the 1983 report, Native Children and the child welfare system. It refers to the mass removal of children from their families into the child welfare system in Canada without any consent from their families or the uh, indigenous communities that they were a part of. And we're talking newborn children just scooped from their mothers and taken away. It's not referring to a specific government policy. It's referring to a phase of Canadian history where children were taken from their families. And the root of this was white supremacy. It was not fear. I will come back to that. It starts in 1951 and there's 29 children and then that number grows and grows and grows. 70% of these children were placed into non-native homes. Why? Because white supremacy. Their new residences were places where their culture and their heritage were denied. They were told, do not speak your language, just like they were told this in the residential schools. So the 60 Scoop and the residential homes 
Indians are related injustices that Canada forced upon the people native to that land. They were there first. These were related issues inflicted upon native folks by the Canadian settler government. And right now I'm going to focus on the Canadian government's treatment of indigenous people and then talk about the United States a bit later. And this is because Clune specifically said he was inspired by the 60s scoop that this book was formed because it did not take shape until he learned about the 60s scoop, which means that it was formative to the book that cannot be divorced. In 2021 is when the discussion about these interviews started happening and people were like, hey, that's fucked up. And particularly this discussion was had right around May 2021. And something else happened around May 2021 that was very much related. Trigger warning for child death. In May of 2021, May 28, 2021, remains of 215 children found buried at former British Columbian residential schools were found. 215 children's bodies. This was a residential school that was previously run by the Catholic Church and then taken over by the federal government and it closed in 1978. These children all would have come from First Nations communities and this deeply impacted the First Nations community in Canada. Finding these bodies was extremely excruciating for them. The First Nations Health Authority CEO Richard Jock said that this situation exists is sadly not a surprise and illustrates the damaging and lasting impacts that the residential school system continues to have on First Nations people, their families, and their communities. And by September, more bodies had been found at residential school sites. And these issues that Clune felt appropriate to write about are not settled issues. And he, he knew that to some degree. In 2020, it was revealed that Ottawa had spent $3.2 million dollars fighting St. Anne's residential school survivors in court since 2013. They had been lying about trying to reconcile what they had done, what the government, the Canadian government had done to Indigenous folks. They were supposed to hand over records and more than 12,000 release documents had been heavily redacted. St. Anne's survivors have uh, launched suits trying to get compensation and the government has been fighting them and spending millions of dollars doing it. A survivor of St. Anne's said, I'm so overwhelmed and so angry. I'm so disgusted with the Canadian government for wasting all this money to fight us in court. This is not the definition of a reconciliation. Canada's actions need to match their words. You might notice that kindness is not the way that we fix an issue. Reconciliation does not happen through kindness. So yes, TJ, that was very trite of you. Okay, now that you know what he said and what the context is, let's talk about why this is a problem. Like, let's get very specific about it. This is white saviorism. White savior complex, also known as white saviorism, is an ideology where a white person acts from a position of superiority to rescue people who are uh, BIPOC, so black, indigenous, people of color, either like singularly as a person or as a like a community. Really great example of this is Christian missionary work where uh, predominantly white Christians in the United States go to other countries. Unfortunately, literally all of my family has done this except for me, all of my immediate family, brother, sister, mom, and dad, to save them with Jesus while ignoring like what the local voices are saying and um, not prioritizing them and not actually meeting the needs that the community says that they need and instead doing what they think is best for them. So white savior complex is actions care carried out with an underlying belief that they know best or that they have skills or information that the BIPOC folks that they are rescuing do not have. That they are a person, the white savior is the person in the situation who has more knowledge and know-how into solving whatever problem they're seeing than the people who are actually impacted by the problem. The way to avoid this is to follow the lead of the affected voices in the scenario, the people of color in the scenario, in whatever space or issue you are traversing. Um, so in this case, it's anti-indigenous harm and Clune has not been following the lead of indigenous leaders. He has the idea that kindness solves this issue and felt he was uniquely qualified somehow to write a story where that was the answer. It's white saviorism but it's the more insidious kind in my opinion that doesn't recognize it's harming even when it's told it's doing harm. It's paternalistic in its type of white saviorism it says but I'm just trying to help. Intent is not impact and your focus on your personal intention when you do white savior 
behaviorism leaves out the context and the nuance in the situation. The reality is that since this story, as Loon admits, did not have shape without the very real 60s scoop, it cannot be divorced from that context. So viewing the story through the lens that Kloon himself gave us, we have to draw lines between the real world and the fictional world that he created. So we have a world where magical beings, either creatures or like humans with a magical ability, so like one of the kids is the Antichrist, but then the other is just a blob, are othered. They are already dehumanized. <laughs> Some of them are literally not human. And assumedly, given the lens that Kloon himself gave us, these are supposed to be the allegory for indigenous children. They are forcibly removed from their homes, they are kept in a form of detainment, and they are subject to plenty of, temp of attempts from the people in charge or non-magical folks in general to assimilate these children. These kids are then written by Kloon to be super nice and not scary, but the non-magical folks, particularly ones in charge, are just so terrified of them. These kids are so scary. We just don't understand them and that's why we're treating them like this. Our intentions are good. We're just terrified. And if we just got to know them a little better, we could all be good and join hands and sing a song together like the end of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. This reframes the treatment of indigenous people, the treatment being what Kloon admits to being the formative thing in his work to a simple misunderstanding by those doing settler colonialism. They just didn't understand them and they feared what they didn't understand rather than intentional actions rooted in white supremacy, which is what it is. But Kloon framed it as the former and that is dangerous because it alleviates some of the guilt that is upon those doing white supremacy and settler colonialism. As if they didn't have a choice in the in the matter. They were just reacting. They were just scared. They were just having a natural scared reaction and then they just made bad choices. A good intentioned white guy, he just didn't understand until he met some of the good ones and then he did. Racism solved. Let's all sing a song. How did Kloon put it? I never strayed away from kindness as a theme. It was and is still important to me. To offer a hand in compassion rather than a fist in anger seems like it should be common sense, but many appear to have forgotten that. We, like Linus discovers, need to use our voices for those who can't speak for themselves. So the answer is Linus humanizing these inhuman beings and being kinder and being a voice for the kids. That's just not it. The communities these kids are from, that's who needs to be listened to. And it was the same in his book and it should have been that way in real life and it should have been that way in his book. Linus should defer to them and amplify their voices, and so should T.J. Klune. The reason why anti-racist educators have called their books and other edu educational materials literally doing the work is because there is a ton of work to be done to get a person to a place of having unlearned their implicit and explicit racism. I just talked about this in another video. The fact that it is interwoven into systems means you don't have just the internal work, but you have the external work. Right now, there's that other conversation we just had with that other author, Tilly Cole, who wrote a romance between a former KKK member and the daughter of a cartel member and it in the beginning of the book does what TJ Klune is doing where it makes it sound like okay this little boy was not racist until he was taught to fear the Latinos for his brother's sake so it was noble it was noble fear that's just not how racism works and therefore that's not how undoing racism works framing it like this is whitewashing what we know historically people framing it like this is whitewashing both historical racism and present day racism. People were not doing acts of racism because of fear. They were doing it, be they, they were and are doing it because of white supremacy. Now, whether or not they recognize this as white supremacy could go either way. However, it still is rooted in that. That mindset of, oh, I just fear them until I meet a safe one is a lot easier of a narrative than what is actually true. When you frame it like that, it does not address that racism is not from a place of fear. Racism is reinforced in many ways in systems, in media. It is not a personal issue of fear. It is a systemic issue that is reinforced in a thousand different ways. And the fix is not just a simple act of kindness because the creation of it was not a simple act. There's been such a reinforcement of dehumanization of Native folks and now that we don't see our government actively what looks like committing genocide or recreating residential schools for Native folks, we think there's no work to be done. Or at least the only work that needs to be done is kindness. And speaking up and saying, hey, that's not nice. Let's be kind. All this to say, the only work, according to TJ Klune, to be done is kindness. That's not, that's not how it works. This whitewashes both the history and the present of this issue. Native folks were dehumanized then, they are dehumanized now, and Klune plays into this 
in his book by literally making the allegorical native kids inhuman beings and then speaking for and over them and saying, oh, well, I met you and now I'm not afraid of you anymore. And now you can live with me in this house and not with your natural born family. Like, um, that is not the takeaway we should be having from the 60s scoop. And the thing is that TJ Klune knows this conversation is happening. He knows that his words in his books matter because in 2020, he was told by readers that his other series, The Extraordinaries, contained uncomfortable pro-police content. This was especially heightened in 2020 because of the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd at the hands of police, and he ended up responding to this. Hindsight is a horrible thing, and it can be humbling. America and the world at large is in the middle of a reckoning. Black people and people of color are suffering at the hands of police. There's no debate about that. And here I am releasing a book in which cops are portrayed positively, a YA book at that. Nick Bell, the 16-year-old narrator, is a son of a police officer, and in his world, the police, through Nick's eyes, because of the love he has for his father, are seen as the good guys. That's what what Nick believes. Given the common theme of antagonism between superheroes and police, I thought it would be interesting to have Nick caught in the middle between his loyalty to his police officer father and his loyalty to his superhero crush. And in the backstory, Nick's father, Aaron Bell, makes an egregious mistake. He punches a witness who was goading him into his recently, about his recently deceased wife. Aaron was briefly suspended and then demoted down to patrol officer, but it wasn't enough. Officers who act violently towards civilians should lose their jobs and face charges. End of story. This book had sensitivity readers, but the onus is on me because these are my words and this is my story and I didn't know we'd be in the middle of a necessary reckoning when I wrote this book three years ago or when I finished edits a year ago or when Tor Teen started promoting the book at the beginning of the year but the Black Lives Matter movement has been around since 2013 raising awareness around issues of police brutality and I did know police hurt people. The good news is the series isn't over. On Wednesday July 15th I sent my publisher an email because I wanted to open the conversation about how to make this right in my work going forward. The second book in the series is already written but hasn't been edited. My editor and I will take be taking this conversation very seriously going forward, if Nick were living in our world over the past few months, he would have a lot to say about police brutality and he would be on the right side of history. And in case you need to know what side that is, I'm the author and these are my words. I do not condone police violence. I fully support defunding the police. I promise to think about how things are in the real world and what that means for my work going forward. I have a duty and an obligation not only to entertain, but to make sure the message I'm sending is authentic. Some of you might think this is an overreaction, that a story is just a story. You're entitled to your opinion, but I do believe words do have power are both good and bad. I owe it not only to do right by my readers, but the characters I love as well. Thanks for reading. So you would hope that he would do a similar thing in this case, because Indigenous folks have come forward again and again and again and again and again to talk about how this is hurtful and harmful. Unfortunately, he did not. And now a sequel is coming out next year. Now, I have no idea if he did this next thing on purpose, but a few people have pointed out things about the sequel. This is the cover. It comes out on September 10th. And I do want to point out it is a weird month to pick September because September 10th is not far off from September 30th and September 30th every year in Canada is Orange Shirt Day which is a day where they honor in particular the indigenous children who were sent to residential schools and forced to assimilate into the dominant Canadian culture. So September yeah that that is a weird and interesting choice for a release date for this particular book. I I, I am kind of uncomfortable with that. Some folks have noted the um, orange fire on the cover felt like a pointed choice and others have pointed out that they feel like the synopsis almost feels like a doubling down, like a response to what happened. The synopsis reads, a magical house, a secret past, a summons that could change everything. Arthur Parnassus lives a good life, built on the ashes of a bad one. He's the master of a strange orphanage on a distant and peculiar island and he hopes to be soon the adopted father to the six dangerous and magical children who live there. Arthur works hard and loves his whole heart so none of the children ever feel the neglect and pain that he once felt as an orphan on that very same island so long ago. He is not alone. Joining him is the love of his life, Linus Baker, a former caseworker in the department in charge of magical youth. And there's the island sprite, Zoe Chapelway, and her girlfriend, Mayor Helen Webb. Together, they will do anything to protect the children. But when Arthur is summoned to make a public statement about his dark past, he finds himself at the helm of a fight for the future of his, that his family and all magical people deserve. And when a new magical child hopes to join them on their island home, one who finds power in calling himself a monster, a name that Arthur worked so hard to protect 
protect his children from, Arthur knows they're at a breaking point. Their family will either grow stronger than ever or fall apart. Welcome back to Marcius Island. This is Arthur's story. Somewhere Beyond the Sea is a story of resistance lovingly told about the daunting experience of fighting for the life you want to live and doing the work to keep it. So some have noted that the description feels like doubling down, particularly in that part about Arthur being summoned to make a statement about his past. Whether or not this is the case, I don't personally know. I'm just relaying the information to you. What I do know is this. TJ Klune knew better. He knows better now. And when you know better, you should do better. He has not addressed this at all, let alone addressed it properly. That lived reality was not his to take and base a white saviorism story off of in the first place. And he doesn't seem to care because if he did, then he would uplift the voices of the indigenous community that he used to create a fantasy story about. He, as a queer guy, knows very well the importance of being able to tell your own story. When you're from a marginalized community facing discrimination and silencing both historically and presently, this would be like somebody who thinks that they're being an ally misrepresenting the issue of queer phobia and saying that it can be solved with kindness. And although he said something about the police, the pro police narrative in The Extraordinaries in his other book and recognized that harm, he has not done that for this book. And further, it's not like he uses his platform to aid in uplifting the voices of indigenous folks who are still being impacted by this in Canada, where he took the story from. And sure, he isn't Canadian, but similar trends exist here in the United States for indigenous folks. It's not just kids at our border that are treated like shit, and they are, but similar trends to what happened in Canada exist here in the United States. The same things that were similar things that were done to the Canadian indigenous population, both historically and presently, are done to the indigenous population of what is now the United States. His and my government, the United States, just had the very related to what he's related writing about ICWA case. And he said nothing about this, just like he said nothing about the bodies of indigenous children found at residential school sites in Canada. I think he should have. He knew that he needed to when it came to the issue with the extraordinaries. And he should have said something about this, especially when he's profiting off of it. All of us white queer folks want people to stand up in solidarity with us and uplift our voices. And he should be doing the same for indigenous folks, especially if he's going to take their stories, use it to shape an entire book, and then profit off of that. So ICWA, if you don't know, stands for the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was enacted here in the United States in 1978, and it happened because an astronomical amount between 25 and 35 of Native American children and Alaska Native children, which is going to be relevant very much in a second, were being taken away from their families and tribes and being placed with new families, 85% of those kids being placed with families outside of their Native tribe, particularly with white families. Congressional testimony had documented the devastating impacts that this had had on Native kids and their families and their tribes. And the intention with ICWA by Congress was to, quote, protect the best interests of Indian children and to promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. ICWA gives tribal governments jurisdiction jurisdiction over what happens to kids placed in foster care, the particular, the kids who come from their tribes. It also gave Native American parents the right to refuse their kids going to residential schools. And this happened because of years of evidence, very damning evidence, that showed the abuse of children in residential schools. This is why ICWA it came about in 1978. So when a native child enters foster care, they first look for a biological relative, then other tribe members, and then other native parents outside of the tribe. Because it has been shown to be in the best interest of native kids to stay within their communities. This preserves their culture, it preserves tribal sovereignty, it preserves their language, and it helps them maintain a sense of individual identity. And then it was challenged recently and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And do you want to know by whom it was challenged? Do you want to guess? Do you want to take a gander on who would have an interest in separating Native kids from their families? It was white parents in Texas. White parents in Texas had been trying to adopt an Indigenous child. They argued that ICWA was racist against them. This case was Holland v. Bracken. It was the lawsuit brought by Texas who alleged that ICWA was unconstitutional, that it was being racist because a federal district court in Texas said that ICWA was violating the Constitution. So this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, right, who said back in June of this year, 2023, that ICWA was not in violation of the US Constitution and would remain. I'll leave a link below explaining what happened. We were all really fucking scared there for a minute, especially, obviously, the indigenous community, the Native American community. However, TJ Klune said nothing about this. Now, I'm not saying you always have to speak up, but if you are taking the time to profit off of something and you acknowledge that you are profiting off of the stories of an indigenous community in a country that you don't even reside in, you can take the time to speak up for them, especially when you said, we need to be a voice for the voiceless. Are you going to? I thought you were about that. That's what your book you said was about.
about kindness being a voice for the voiceless let's pretend that they're voiceless let's pretend they have not been actively voicing this concern aren't you gonna say something if you're gonna profit off of them then you do have that responsibility too now ICWA is not like this perfect system because unfortunately indigenous communities are speaking up about what's happening to them and what's happening to them despite ICWA is shitty and we do have the responsibility to speak up about it one case in particular that's happening right now that we do need to be speaking up on is the case of Chanel who's an Alaska native child belonging to the village of Selowick her biological mother was murdered by her biological father brutally and yet he was able to maintain his parental rights and he signed over Chanel to his friends a white couple Nikki Richmond and her boyfriend Joseph Jerko now what he really signed over was power of attorney they are not her adoptive parents they have not a formal formally adopted her I will leave a list a link of a video series explaining all of this but this is ongoing and you should be informed about this why parental rights were allowed for Chanel's father to maintain after he murdered her mother I, I don't know but this has been going on for four years her maternal grandmother her mother's mom wants to take custody of her her, but she ended up in the care of Nikki and Joseph who call her things like Mowgli and little native baby instead of her name and they say racist shit about Native Americans calling them alcoholics and drug addicts which are dangerous and untrue stereotypes which are used to keep native kids away from their biological families and communities already and it's also really fucking rich about with the drug addicts part because part because Joseph Jerko himself has a record including possession of cocaine and then Nikki had the audacity to claim native heritage but all signs point to Nikki being not native whatsoever. The indigenous community has rallied to support Chanel's grandmother. Back in December tribal court told Nikki and Jerko that Chanel needed to be returned to her family. Again tribal court has the power here because of ICWA or at least they should. Her maternal grandmother wants custody of her and her community the village of Selowick is prepared to support them and yet Nikki and her lawyer have engaged in practices intended to silence the the native community involved in this, including getting Chanel's mother's best friend removed from speaking at an event talking about violence against indigenous women, despite her not having done anything wrong and not being involved in the case. Nikki's lawyer called and complained and now Chanel's mother's best friend cannot speak at the event. There is no way other way to put that, but that is silencing an indigenous woman, period. Nikki and her cohorts also have reported the website dedicated to talking about this issue called Bring Chanel Home. They've reported it constantly for phishing that it was then flagged on men. Eventually Arlene, Chanel's maternal grandmother, was granted custody again back in summer and they were supposed to enter a transitional period. Again, the tribal court, which has jurisdiction, said Chanel needs to go live with her grandmother and they ordered a transitionary period of three weeks starting July 31st, but Nikki Richmond has continued to go around tribal law despite ICWA evading giving Chanel to her grandmother at all. Whenever Chanel's grandmother shows up, Nikki pretends not to be home. She goes to the daycare, they, the daycare says Chanel's not here and Nikki has not paid the money that the court ordered her to pay for wasting the court's time. Meanwhile, every time there is a court date, Chanel's grandmother has to fly from her native village of Selowick to Fairbanks and pay for a place to stay. This is fucking expensive. Arlene was there to do this transitionary period at the end of July, and instead of complying, Nikki Richmond filed an order of protection against Arlene, an old woman just trying to do what the tribal court said to do. So now they have to have another hearing about this, which is coming up on November 16th, all because a white woman feels entitled to save an indigenous child from her own family and people. She also has not been taking Chanel to therapy, a child whose own mother was brutally murdered by her own father and then she was kept from her community. But Nikki, Nikki knows what's best for Chanel because Nikki wants to be a white savior. Again, the next court case is in Fairbanks, Alaska on November 16th. Please speak up about this. Intervention needs to be had in this case and we only get that if more people know about it, so please speak up about it. If you have a huge platform, you should use it. I'll leave all of the links for this down below. The point is TJ Klune decided to take an ongoing issue. It is not just history. It is reality for so many people still living in Canada who were affected by the 60s scoop. He took an ongoing issue and wrote an insensitive, inaccurate portrayal of it. And not only does he do this, he ignores the ongoing related issues of Native American folks, not just in Canada, who he stole from, but the ones right here in his own country. If you have time to research your neighboring country and use the trauma of their indigenous population to get the creative juices flowing, and write insensitive portrayals. You have time to uplift native voices, not speak for them, but uplift them, both there and in your own country. TJ Klune knew to be more responsible after the Extraordinaries issue, and he needs to be more responsible in this case as well. I'll uh, leave resources down below.
down below. I recommend you check them out. Please go look. There will be places to donate as well as books to add on Goodreads, info on Chanel's case, info on the issues with the Canadian court spending money instead of repairing the issues that they caused against Native American communities as well as the news articles about the bodies of the Indigenous children found at the residential school sites. Please go check them out. Support Indigenous Native American communities and do better than TJ Klune did. Thanks for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. Behave. I don't care about your feelings if you like the book. That's okay. Fine. I liked it too. It does not mean that harm was not done and that we don't have a responsibility to do better for each other. Okay? Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. Hi! Before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons and those are Alexander, Ally Magpie, Brittany Bobitney, Cammie, Chris, Claire, Des Roberts, DJ Rocktopus, Ellie, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron, Eric, Carly, Jack and Jill, John E, Kaleno K, sorry, Casey Mackenzie, Kate W, Caitlin M, Quinn, Lady Kittybug, Lex, Alice, Peggy Lou, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Scarlet, Shiny, and SMK. Thank you all so much for being a friend. And last but not least, before I go to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Search Marxist patrons, and those are AM Angel, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley H, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, BB, Beck Blythe, Bookish Brain Rot, Bree, Brienne, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin, Cassandra, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Cole, Colleen, Corwin, Corey, Darren, Debra, Dex, Diet Goth, Dorian, Ebby, Ember, Emily A, Emily L, Emma O A, Aaron, Ezra, Hannah C, Hannah T, Harpy Kiro, Haley G, Ilianaka, India Inks, JM Tennant, J is on Olympus, JT, Jen Michelle, Jenny G, Jess Burler, Jessa Sue, Jillian, Jojo Bookish, Jess Pugsley, Kaylee, Kat, Catherine M, Katie, Katya, Kayala, Kendra, not another cowboy romance. Are you kidding me? <laughs> With a K? <laughs> Kylie, Lev and Cat Dog, Laura, Lev. Lazarus Ray. Y'all are killing me with your name changes on Patreon. <laughs> Library of Scars. Lisa V. LP. Al oh man. LP. Sorry. Loose Siri. Luna Moth. Lustful Octopus. Martin. Madison. Marcella. Marquita. Malara. MK Books. Molly. James. Nat. Natalie. Never. Nicole G. Nicole R. Nyan Binary. Paige P. Penny Chilling. Foxglove. Pixel Stars. Piratheon. Rachel B. Rat Sarah. Reba. Rebecca. Robin. Rosie Thorns. Rowan. Sicoria. Sadie. Samantha. Sarah C. Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sheena K, Sean, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Tina, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Tito Phoenix, Wildcat, and Ryder A. Thank you all so much for being a friend. Mm -hmm.